Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. So we're here today with Laura Mesa, and she's one of a group of breeders at Ball Horticultural in the US. And we're here to pick her brains on how new plants are created to explore the whole journey of a plant from conception of an idea to getting into your borders at home and loads else besides. We hope to get a few tips for new patio plants, basket plants. Mm -hmm. But I know that she won't tell us everything because there's a lot of confidentiality when it comes to breeding brand new plants. But anyway, welcome to the podcast, Laura. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Of course, this is a follow up from our visit to Bull Colgrave the other day. Yeah, so we will have seen some of your varieties there. And obviously, you're you're over in California. Is that right? That's where you're breeding? Yes. So, um, yeah, I I saw what y'all posted from Bob Colgrave. I was so excited. Y'all got to (laughs) to see all that stuff. I've I've yet to go over there, but um, every year, I'm trying. And then obviously yeah. the last couple of years, I can't get to Europe at all. But yeah, uh, yeah. so I work with Ball Horticulture and I am a division of Ball Horticulture, uh, Ball Floor Plant. And we are located in Arroyo Grande. Um, so it's central California. We're about three hours north of LA, three hours south of San Francisco. And we're here because it's a wonderful growing environment. Mm-hmm. So it's not too hot, it's not too cold, and it makes for beautiful, beautiful flowers. So it's important in breeding to be able to see flowers at essentially what is their peak performance. Mm-hmm. And and we get that here. Do you know what? I'm so fascinated, Laura, because I don't get to see behind the scenes, you know, with the breeding, that kind of thing before. So when I went to Bull Colgrave, um, just the other day, I was literally <laughs> beside myself with giddiness at just seeing all of these amazing plants, new plants that are coming to the market. And yeah. it totally fascinates me, you know, as someone who is, you know, I promote mm. plants, I promote the well being benefits of plants, um, and I talk about, you know, how to garden. But actually, what comes before all of that is mm. where do the plants come from in the first place? So mm-hmm. it, I find it incredible, uh, so fascinating. And I'd love to know, you know, how how did you get involved in, in this? You know, what what did you study if you did? You know, how long have you been working with ball? Like, what's your background with regards okay. to kind of plant breeding? Yeah, so... Um... It was a long journey to get here and actually got there kind of the way you're describing being fascinated with it and just having so many questions. Um, So my journey uh, into uh, the plant world um, didn't really develop until probably in my 20s. So I grew up, I grew up inner city, Houston, Texas. Um, My mom came from a long line of farmers, but we we lived in the city. So I wasn't around plants except for when I would go see my grandpa and I would work on his farm and I really liked it, but it wasn't something I was surrounded by. I um, went to college for nutrition and I was also very interested in journalism. Um, and it just, it didn't, it didn't do it for me. I liked it and I still find it a fun hobby to, you know, look at nutrition labels, but it's not what I want to spend my life doing. So I did nutrition for a while. I did sociology. I did psychology. And actually, I eventually dropped out of college and just bartended because uh, that was fun. And there was no reason for me to keep going to college if I wasn't going to do the things that I um, 
was, was, I couldn't find my passion. So eventually I started a little garden. Um, my mom had given me a plant and that plant turned into thousands of plants, um, mm-hmm. you know, little cactuses, you know, succulents, your beginner plants. And then I got Hoyas and begonias and I became fascinated with it. And back then the internet wasn't really a thing. So finding information on how to grow things was, was actually quite hard. And so I started taking horticulture classes at Houston Community College because I just wanted to learn about what to do in the garden. It was a fun thing. Community college is cheap. And I, I did really well and I loved it. And the advisors there were like, well, let's, let's get you into a real college for this if you want to do it. I was able to get in. Um, because I had all my core classes, I was able to graduate with a horticulture degree in about a year um, with the help of some, some fabulous mentors. And then they helped me get into to grad school. Um, and they're like, well, what do you want to get your graduate degree in? And I was like, you know, I find myself looking at flower catalogs a lot. Like I love <laughs> looking <laughs> at flower catalogs. It's like Christmas when the flower catalogs come in the mail. And I was like, you know, what does F1 mean? What does OP mean? What do all of these these designations and these patents mean? And they're like, well, maybe you'd be interested in plant breeding. So I talked to a plant breeding um, graduate professor and he took me in. He was a cotton breeder by trade. And I had really zero desire to go into breeding cotton. Um, <laughs> It's a fabulous crop. Not um, even the <laughs> bulls. I, so I know, <laughs> but they all look the same. <laughs> so, um, luckily, he had some money to work on sunflower, and um, so he was able to get me in under a sunflower grant and do some breeding work on sunflower. And then from there, I went and did my master's. So the, well, the master's was in plant breeding. And then I got my PhD in molecular environmental plant sciences, which essentially gave me more of the biological background of plant breeding. So this is, this is how each gene works. This is uh, the molecular basis for this. This is how pigments work, which was actually quite important to learn considering my job in flowers now. Um, colors based so much on these chemical pigments. And so it's great to know how that's work. Wow. Sorry, then, it's a long answer. <laughs> no, no, I, I was fascinated. And also, weirdly, my nephew went to Houston Community College. Oh, oh weird. What a small world. Anyway, carry on. Small world. And then, Anna, how did you then come across your role at Ball then? How long have you been in the company there? Yeah, so I was, I think, very fortunate to get the job here. Um I had a friend who graduated when I was starting my PhD at Texas A&M. Um, he had graduated from Texas A&M and he came to work here with Pan American Seed. And they had a breeder leave and he immediately contacted me and he was like, I know you're about a year out from graduating, but I just wanted to let you know there's a vacancy. Um, so I wrote the hiring manager a letter And I got very lucky that one of the HR people happened to be in College Chase in Texas, the place I was living, the next day. Mm -hmm. So I went and had breakfast um, with him. And um, I didn't hear back from him for about two months. And I was like, well, you know, that was it. That was, you know, nice little breakfast with HR. I got to learn about ball. Mm -hmm. And um, then they were like, okay, yeah, we're, g- we're going to go ahead and extend you an offer. How, how soon can you get here? And um, so they waited for me to finish um, defending my thesis. And so as soon as I defended my thesis, they flew me out here. And so I was basically doing edits to my dissertation while I was reading trials. Um, wow. So, yeah, I uh, got to get all that done and start a new job. And so I've been here for five years now. Right. Yeah. Wow, how cool. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> You're a definite plant addict. Do you remember <laughs> the world? And I think I you probably kind of classify it as you're doing your dream job. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's cool. You can tell. You can see that. Yeah. As well. <laughs> Amazing. Well, so, and, at, and at Bull then, so you're now working <laughs> with specific genera. Have you been working with the same genera since you joined? 
kind of which, which ones are under your jurisdiction? Yeah. So for the most part, I've had the same genera since I mm-hmm. joined. We've had a few things shuffled around, but um, it takes a while to know a crop. Um, I'm in my fifth year and I want to say now I'm really, really comfortable in my crops. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, just can continue to, to grow and learn more about them. Um, so I do caliber koa, which mm-hmm. people know as million bells. It's one of the biggest selling ornamental crops in the world because um, it's super cute, colorful, so many mm-hmm. patterns, very versatile in mixes. Mm-hmm. And then I do Angelonia. Um, so it's also called Summer Snapdragon. Mm-hmm. And then I do Coleus, which everybody loves. Yeah. Um, so I was very, also very lucky that when I came in, I told them I wanted to breed, breed Coleus. There wasn't a Coleus breeding program at Ball Floor Plant. We were sourcing Coleus from other breeders. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of the larger breeding companies actually do that with Coleus. They source from one major breeder out of Florida. Um, but I was like, if we have the space and we have the resources, why aren't we breeding this ourselves? There's so much to do in coleus, like, mm-hmm. um, the, the sky's the limit on coleus. And then I breed a little bit of passion flower okay. and, um, the verbena. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So if I ever get bored with something, I can just move on to something else and, you know, make my day um as pleasant as i like <laughs> how can it not that's be really pleasant cool. when you're surrounded by plants that's oh, for wow. sure very you true know, when you were younger did you experiment with plants at all and can you kind of remember the very first plant that you did breed yeah so i didn't breed plants at all i um wasn't an experimenter with plants i loved science like i remember when my favorite gifts I ever got was like a science experiment where you could just like make things bubble over and, you know, make crystals. Um, I can remember my first plant as a kid, my mother bought me those little dragon fruits with the cactus grafted on top. Yeah. So I had a red one that looked like a tomato and a blue one that looked like a banana and they were named Uh tomato and banana. (laughs) And I just remember staring at them, um, being fascinated by them. And still, you know, I think they're pretty cheesy, but still quite oh. fascinating to look at. Yeah, they're really accessible for kids, they aren't are, they? Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing with, like, if you go to the big box stores now and they have the um, aloes or agave spray painted neon. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, they don't they don't know it's fake. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that they're spray painted, but if it gets people interested in plants, then... Yeah, oh, totally. They're great entry-level plants, you know, no matter what the snobs say about them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, oh. exactly. And then when I moved out of my parents' house for college, my mother gave me a philodendron, and mm-hmm. I, I, will remember the, I will remember the day she gave it to me forever. I told her I did not want it. Um, I was like, I have a cat to take care of. I I don't need anything else. And she was like, take it. You're going to love it. Like, I will never forget those words. And so that was my first very own house plant. And I will also remember the day it died. Um, But yeah, philodendrons are, they can be a little touchy sometimes yeah. <laughs> yeah. alacasia i can never get with that either i, no. I put them in the same category of like yeah don't even want to touch them yeah. <laughs> it's touchy yeah yeah but since you've been a, a bull flora plant then for five years mm-hmm. have you had any um varieties that have gone commercially available whilst you've been there yeah so the of those luckily um my crops move pretty fast. So I've been able to get some breeding done. In Caliber Coa, I can get two cycles of breeding done in a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm going to say my first big introduction of Caliber Coa, um, Mary Ellen, you actually posted it on your Instagram page, was the Goodnight Kiss. So ah. it's the, yeah, the hot pink with the black eye and the yellow yeah, star. That's, oh, that's yeah, beautiful. that one's awesome. That's oh, my gosh. Beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Thank you. So that one was my first big one. And then Diva Orange, which you also posted. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's like a red with a little bit of a star, but then you put it in the sun and it really does turn orange. Oh, wow. wow. You must so, feel amazing when you see someone like Ellen post one of your <laughs> pictures. That must yes. feel amazing to see that plant. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see. Oh, I love that people love my plants. I love yeah, that I'm yeah, yeah. helping to bring joy to other people's lives. Um, And it's just, it's so amazing that what I made here in California can reach the other side of the world. Yeah, Yeah, that's really cool. How exciting. (laughs) I want to know, how does it all start? Like, where does the idea start for a new plant in the first place? And kind of who is involved? Is it just you, but like behind the scenes breeding? You know, does the consumer have any kind of involvement? How Mm -hmm. how do you decide where to start? Yeah, so it's not one real clear answer to that. It's basically, uh, however it happens, it happens. So I can work by myself to come up with a new idea and then pitch it to the group. Or two times, well, once every two years, we have a big group meeting with all of the product managers, territory managers, um, sales managers, and we decide if there's another genera or spec that we want to breed for. So um, there were some genera we weren't breeding in a couple of years ago that we've decided to take on. So we'll be putting those out in the market in a couple of years, but something like Goodnight Kiss, where it's just a different pattern. um, I, I can, you know, it's more of like a conceptual thing. Like Mm-hmm. I do meditation, I do yoga, and I'm like, okay, what happens if I mix this trait with this trait and I can kind of visualize it and oh. think about it and decide the best route to get it there? Um, and, you know, I'll go pick it if it looks cool. You know, usually if something looks cool to me, it's going to look cool to the rest of the group. Um I, you know, every once in a while, like something really weird and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to wait a, a couple of years to show them this and see if they really? like it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> or, or even so, so much patience. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you know, like, can, you know, yeah. in a few years or, you know, this might come out in a few years or this took me yeah. a few years. I'd be like, yes. oh my God, I've got this idea. It's amazing. And I want everyone to have it now. Especially <laughs> in terms of them posting the pictures. Cause of course you can't do that. At an mm-hmm. early stage, Cause that puts all sorts of things at risk as well. Yeah. It's, oh, it's very amazing. hard. <laughs> Yeah. Hence the yeah. meditation. <laughs> um, but with yes. like the Calibra Her, for example, like mm-hmm. the Goodnight Kiss, they wouldn't necessarily sit in a series, would they? Would they be released as novelties? Like, I mean, is there still places for them if they don't sit in a series? Okay. Yeah, so for the most part, we try to get everything in this series. Um, mm-hmm. Ball Floor Plant is known as this series company, and Cabaret is the, I believe, the biggest selling Cab- uh, Calabrocoa series on the market. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we want things to go in Cabaret if they fit. If not, in very special circumstances, if they're special enough, we can find a place in um, as a standalone. And sometimes we can kind of put it in another series. So we have another Calabrocoa series called Bumblebee. And Bumblebee essentially is unified by a fat star. So um, I came out with Bumblebee Orange last year. I don't know if y'all seen it in Europe yet. Um, And it has, you know, a little bit skinny of a star. It's not particularly a Bumblebee pattern, but it was such a special pattern like in such a special color that we decided it was, it could go into, into the bumblebee collection. Um, and then with, uh, we have another one called bumblebee hot pink, which y'all should get in a couple of years. And, um, it's very bright. People seem to love it here. It doesn't have the, the kiss that most of the bumblebee have, but, um, we were able to put it there. So yeah, we can have standalones, but generally we try to make it fit into a series. And if it is a standalone, we try to have at least one other plant that you can pair it with because Mm -hmm. the growers love to make mixes. Yeah. That's become such a big thing, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Like pre-programmed mixes as well. So like, um, I don't know if like the consumer wouldn't always realize, but a lot of those mixes that are there, they are programs that everything grows at the same rate as well, aren't they? Mm -hmm. It's not the same as planting a basket in the old days where you might get a Biden's that suddenly becomes Mm -hmm. all Biden's by the end of the summer. So they're really well thought out, these mixes. Yeah, we actually have a person here that 
that's her whole job yeah. is designing yeah. mixes and trialing these mixes. And, um, you know, it's very space consuming and time consuming because it's not usually you have one plant, you've got two plants or three plants and you're constantly trying to figure out which ones work best together. So yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's like wow. But all the things as a consumer, you just don't consider whatsoever when you buy the plant. Well, I when I was working at Thompson Morgan for um, almost 18 years and I was doing the new product development and I would visit a lot of companies, a lot of breeders. And for me, I was selecting for mail order. So this was quite a different type of product to commercial, you know, availability because it didn't have to look good on a garden centre bench. We could select things that the breeders were probably rejecting because Mm -hmm. they didn't have to meet all of this different criteria because the customer was getting a young plant through the mail. So immediately that opens up so many possibilities. And so I remember, you know, trying to get stuff out of the bin, you know, talking to the breeders, trying to convince them to, you know, let us have this one. It wasn't commercially viable, but we would take 10,000, for example. So it was always important for me to get into the kitchen and see Mm -hmm. what was cooking. But my question um, also is, like nowadays with social media, I obviously represent the consumer quite a lot because I've got followers on different social media platforms. Mm-hmm. But I've also got that industry knowledge. And what what kind of what concerns me sometimes is to, how much influence does the consumer have on what we actually then list as a plant or what breeders create? How much are you guys looking at that feedback and kind of you know allowing that to influence your decisions or indeed what plants you're going to create next? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's that's very important, mm. um, and it has a very big impact of what we what we do release. Um, obviously, we have to breed for the grower, and then another aspect mm. that people don't know is that we have to breed for the production farm. Um, so before I was in breeding, I was a consumer. So when I breed, you know those memories of my verbena drying up. Um, they're still there and I don't want that to happen to other people. Um, and the reason is, you know, one, it's heartbreaking and two, it discourages people from gardening and you, you have to have a plant that people want to go to and tell their friends about. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times my mother's like, I've had that petunia for two years. Mm -hmm. Like, and that, that sells a variety and encourages people to go buy petunias, especially if they've had a hard time with petunias before or any other genera. So, um, we, we have, um, companies that we work with that do surveys um, they do consumer surveys mm-hmm. and we're able to receive the results of those surveys. So we know what colors people like, what vigors people like. Um, generally, if people are buying things for their front yards or their backyards or patio pots um, and the traits that they want in a plant. So generally high on the list is drought tolerance and heat tolerance. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you get down to the bottom would probably be like bunny rabbit tolerance. Um, <laughs> or in <laughs> England, rain tolerance, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So floppy petunias. <laughs> oh, so gross. <laughs> yeah, so um, we've been breeding a lot for drought tolerance and heat tolerance. Mm-hmm. And then another thing we're starting to breed more for is the insect attraction mm. so people people, people assume that. that bedding and patio plants don't attract the insects as well as you know say a wistful looking cottage garden or mm-hmm. wilder plants don't they yeah they do assume that mm. but um you know i see my trials and bees love calabrocoa mm. and actually the star on calabrocoa isn't meant for us it's actually meant as a target for yeah. bees they're like hey come here come in the middle <laughs> Um, so yeah, they, the bumblebee star on Calabrocoa attracts bumblebees. Ah, wow. Oh, I never knew that. So, <laughs> cool. so there's so much to consider with plants. And of course, this extra element that we are a lot more environmentally conscious now as well. I'm Joe Bahari. I'm a DIY expert. I know you love your plants, but what about your outdoor spaces? I'm here to give you some DIY tips to keep those outdoor spaces looking as good as your plants do throughout the year. 
So in this podcast, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how to protect your garden and your outdoor spaces over the winter period. The first thing that we need to do is we need to cover up all of our garden furniture so it doesn't get damaged over the winter. If you leave your wooden or your metal furniture or even your plastic furniture out over the winter period, it will get damaged from wind, from rain, from snow, from ice. So the best thing to do to protect it and make sure you don't have to clean it or replace it next spring is to cover it up. You can buy generic garden furniture covers online fairly cheaply these days, or you can use an old tarpaulin. You need to cover the garden furniture and then put something weighty on top, like a couple of bricks or a paving slab, as long as you're not going to damage the furniture underneath, and bungee round the bottom so that the wind can't get in and lift that cover off. Don't forget to do your barbecues as well. Now, you don't want your plants to get frostbite over winter either, so you need to lift any plants that are in planters up off the ground so that the water doesn't get underneath, freeze, and cause your plants to get frostbite. So just if you've got any planters on hard ground, make sure you raise them on a couple of bricks or put them on a pallet so that they've got air circulating underneath them and they don't get too cold over the winter period. Right. Let's talk decking. Hopefully, you've all been going over your decking with a stiff broom throughout the year. This will clear away any dead leaves and moss buildup and prevent any buildup of algae and fungi, which will stain and make a deck slippery. If you haven't been doing that, make sure you do that now. So to protect your deck, you should stain it or oil it, and you should preferably do this in the springtime, but if you haven't done it last spring, you can do it on a nice warm autumn day. Preferably, you should cover your decking up with like a tarpaulin over the winter period. It won't look great, but it will protect it. However, I know you're probably not going to do that. If your decking does get icy, don't use salt because salt will dry out the natural moisture of the wood and cause the wood to corrode a lot more quickly. Instead, remove any snow or ice with a plastic shovel, not a metal one because that will scratch the surface of the wood. And then use sand to make sure that the area isn't too slippery. And remember, when the weather gets warmer, oil that deck again. Finally, one last thing for your outdoor spaces. It's not the most fun job, but you really need to clear your gutters out. Gutters get full of leaves and mulch over the autumn period, and they should be cleared out in spring. But if you haven't done it this year, or even last year, then you need to think about doing it before this current autumn fall. Because the current leaves that are stuck in there, turning to mulch, with more leaves on top from this autumn that's likely to cause a blockage. If your gutters get blocked, then they will overflow with rainwater, causing the rainwater to spill out over the top and damage your walls of your property. No one wants that. You can use something like a gutter wand. They're fairly cheap to buy, maybe 20, 25 pounds. They're telescopic. You can attach a hose to them and they have an angled brush head on the top so you can sweep through your gutters really easily without having to go too high on a ladder because I know not everyone likes that. Make sure you do it before this current autumn, but the best time to do it really is the springtime when the weather gets warmer and all the leaves have fallen. That's it from me. I hope you've enjoyed these tips and I'll be back next time with some more. I just want to ask about kind of, because the customer obviously buys the plant looking good in the garden centre, but it's important that that then goes on to perform, isn't it? So kind of pack trials and garden trials are two Mm -hmm. different elements, really. How do you kind of handle bringing that together? Yeah, we just have to trial for both. So um, we have different trials to suit, um, I guess, to look at all of those traits. So we have greenhouse trials and then we have outside trials. So in the early spring, when a grower would be growing it in their greenhouse, we have trials early spring here in Royal Grande in the greenhouse. So what I see here in week eight, which is, you know, February, is what the grower is going to see. Um, I can look at vigor. I can look at flower size. I can see if there's any sort of disease or some some plants just really want to attract thrips. It's weird, but mm-hmm. you can look at their neighbor and they don't have it or even powdery mildew. So all of those things the growers don't want to have to deal with because if they have to deal with it, it's more money out of their pocket. So I'm breeding to make their job easier. Mm-hmm. And then 
in the later spring going into the summer is when we start to have the outdoor trials. So we trial, you know, for garden performance, and this is what the consumer is going to see. So we have trials in um, Austin, Texas, where it's hot, very hot, and they can also get torrential rains and hail in the spring. And then we have trials in Chicago, where it's very humid, hot, also can be very rainy. Um, we have trials in the spring in Miami. And then, so that's the first year. And then once, you know, plants go through about a year of trialing, we even bump up the trialing even more. So then we go to the Netherlands. Uh, we trial with Florensis. They're one of our partners at Ball Floor Plant. We do greenhouse trials at Florensis. And then, I mean, you've probably seen their outdoor trials in the in week 24, their, mm -hmm. their plants. So we put them out there on the path and let them get beat by rain and whatnot. Um, and then we start sending them to grower trials where the growers will grow them out in their landscapes, um, and they can can look at them essentially as long as they want to. So it's a really long process, isn't it, actually, mm -hmm. once you've gone through all of that. But how does it actually start? Like, what, how do you breed a plant? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> that's that's like, such a wide question. I know, yeah. like, I know but like for a <laughs> listener who like, is going, wow, this is so interesting. Like, how do you even... Mm -hmm go there like how do you do it yeah that, yeah that is <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question it just took me like seven years of grad school to answer that so <laughs> <laughs> um so basically what you want to do as a plant breeder um it's broken up into two sections so you have your crossing um however you want to get pollen from one plant to the other so that's the first part. And then the second part is making your selection. So after you've pollinated your plant, you wait for the seed to start. And then, you know, you sow your seed, you grow out however many you want to. It's really a numbers game. The more you go out, the better selections you're going to get. And you're going to make your selections and you just do it over and over again. So that's the that's the very simple um, part. But to breed a plant? that's a, that's a seven <laughs> second answer instead of the seven year of grad school. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to say it's just you know you're picking the pretty ones. That's that's all you need yeah. to do, and then you can put your name on a patent. <laughs> I won't be plant breeding anytime soon because I don't have the patience. <laughs> well, we're going to ask that's you in part two a little bit about how people at home could actually start breeding a few plants, okay. but before. We go there tell us a bit more about kind of your breeding is there anything that you really really have been trying to breed for many years but mm -hmm. you just you can't get there for one reason or another and of course you know with this answer it might be a blue geranium or it might be a <laughs> pure yellow petunia you know what what are the kind of the holy grail not just for you but for the companies out there as well mm -hmm. so i'd say there's a few um like a blue calibrachoa, like a mm. really true blue calibrachoa, or really a blue anything. So yeah. blue in the floral industry isn't isn't around except for like in delphiniums, delphiniums, mm -hmm. um, which is why the blue compound is called delphinidum. Mm -hmm. um, so we're always trying to amp up the level of delphinidum in, mm -hmm. in everything because it is available. It's just hard to get that, that mm -hmm. level. Um, and then also why we call a lot of purple blue. It's marketing yeah. blue. I often um, see yeah. things that are marketing blue. Marketing blue. Mm -hmm. blue. And I'm like, that is so yeah. not blue. It's not oh. blue. <laughs> it's frustrating uh -huh. for me. Um, so there's that. And then I'd say passion flower. Passion flower is just a really hard crop to breed. Um, okay. It's got all of these boundaries, um, genetic boundaries, which make it don't they don't want to cross with each other. Even there's 500 species in the genus, they they like to stick to themselves. Um, so doing that, not only that, it's a huge plant. So having the space to breed it um, yeah. is hard to come by. And um, I'd say personally, what I would love to breed, but I believe almost every breeder here has tried but it's too hard is asclepius um right. yeah so milkweed has um got these very interesting fertility mechanisms um i saw a paper recently and they did over a thousand crosses right. and i think only seven made seed so i just yeah would love to wow. do it but don't you, have time 
that for the different colors to make different color combinations because you think it could be a yeah. good border plant for bedding it's a yeah it's a beautiful plant yeah. um yeah. get the flowers bigger you know make yeah. it because it is it's called milkweed for a reason it's a little weedy looking yeah so if you could make it more showy to where people would really want to buy it and put it in their yeah. garden and Okay, it's going to get eaten by caterpillars, but that's okay. It was a nice plant. Yeah, they're having fun. <laughs> but it's like, having a great it's time. Milkweed, the main source of um, food for monarch butterflies. Yeah, yeah. So if you if and and you're right, it doesn't look that pretty. We've got mm-hmm. some in pots on our balcony in North Carolina, mm-hmm. and if you could encourage people to buy it because you're breeding something that looks more beautiful, mm-hmm. that would help the monarch butterflies i'm assuming exactly you know, more people will be planting it mm. and we know that we need to keep monarchs on their flight path mm-hmm. through the state mm-hmm. so yeah that's, cool. that's really cool it's yeah. um you talk about angelonia and i've always thought angelonia would be great if it was a bit more hardy a bit more robust and almost like a lupin in mm-hmm. its kind of growth habits and hardiness because then it would fit really nicely into cottage garden schemes and like Mm -hmm. you know become a hardy perennial almost as such but I guess you're still looking for patio performance with Angelonia right? So in our main series Archangel it's we do use it in um in beds here and I have been breeding to make it a more hardy plant Mm. um essentially not a taller plant just kind of keep the medium height with a very yeah. thick stem that doesn't fall over because that, yeah, yeah. that really bothers me. And then also keeping the, the flower size large. Um, you can have a more rugged plant that will stand up um, if you have also more branches and smaller flowers, but that's not our spec. So mm. I've been breeding for the, the rigidity, the large flower, and then something that doesn't flush with the heat. So we we do trial with all of that, but to what you're saying about the cottage garden, um, just wait a couple of years and and, and see Ooh. what hits the market. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um, you mentioned verbena. What are you working on with verbena? Were you involved in the mm-hmm. hardy ones, the Endurascape? They're Endurascape. So yeah. those were bred by Scott Trees, and mm-hmm. um, he had an office right down the hall, but he just retired. Um, so I'm taking over the Endurascape for Scott. Uh-huh. I bred some of the newer releases of Firehouse. There's the Purple Fizz. It's a purple and white bicolor, got a large flower, and is quite garden um, Mm -hmm. hardy, powdery mildew resistant or tolerant. Um, It's a really good plant. So, um, and then we have another spec, which is the Cadet Uprights, which is kind of, it's a real pot plant. So Mm. it grows upright and you can put some trailing plants around it and make a really nice mix with that. I've always thought there's a nice market for upright verbenas with the big hyacinth flight blooms as well. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. And how much are you looking at fragrance with the verbena? Not at all. Yeah, because so. there's obviously a few around with a really nice, sweet fragrance. Um, this actually leads me into sorry, I've got so many questions. You I'm do. sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but let's start talking about plants. I know. Um, what about though, if say if you wanted to breed fragrant verbena, but then it's not in the kind of spec and not in the plan at mm-hmm. ball, would you? Mm-hmm. Would you be able to, would you want to then just kind of beaver away in your backyard at home or kind of, it must be hard sometimes yeah. if the company line isn't to breed a fragrant upright verbena, but you really mm-hmm. feel like it should happen. Do you just do it in the background? Then one day turn up with a plant and say, here you go, <laughs> want it? <laughs> uh, let's see. I don't think I've done that yet. I think I've had that idea, but I have the same problem that you do, Michaels, where I can't really spend the time on it. So yeah, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's been some <laughs> weird coleus that I've brought home. Like, okay, we're going to make that a new thing. It's really weird. Um, but I don't want to, you know, waste the company resources on it. I don't mm-hmm. want my boss to to think I've really lost it this time. So, um, but unfortunately I'll take them home and I'll just forget about them. And well, sometimes that's the thing to do with coleus to get them to seed, but it it hasn't worked out. Um, so there are some other genera that I play with at home outside my genera, like the epiphytes. I love, those are so fun to cross. Um, and I can talk to y'all more about like how to cross those later, but yeah, yeah. Like, the company doesn't really want it yet, but 
maybe if they could see what I'm working on in a couple of years. Yeah. They don't know what they want. <laughs> they don't know what they want. But with the popularity of houseplants, you know, like mm-hmm. there are, there's not necessarily that much new houseplant breeding that's happening. Mm-mm. Obviously, there's lots of growers now, but I think that's going to start to increase a lot. And, you know, various bigger companies are starting to add that into their programs, aren't they? So, yeah, yeah. it could well happen. Yeah, definitely. It's it's going to it's going to be big. It's going to be big. I think a lot of companies are getting into it. Amazing. Well, I'm going to just carry on straight on with the next okay. question from here, and that is first of all because we were mention, mentioning you going home. Would you do it on the side <laughs> mm-hmm. so you could introduce it? What's your garden like at home? Do you have yeah. a garden yourself? I d- yeah, I do. Um, so I have a small little apartment, and it's close to the beach. And because it is close to the beach, I have a hard time growing anything in ground because I'm essentially on sand. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also because it's by the coldest freaking ocean in the world, it's (laughs) it's pretty cold here. I'm sure it's not as cold as the sea. (laughs) We we live by by the North Sea. It's literally (laughs) true. (laughs) Don't sit there and tell me California is cold. When I moved here, I was like, oh, how can they breed plants in Antarctica? It's so cold <laughs> <laughs> compared to Texas. But yeah, I'm just, I'm just a lightweight. I can't take it. Um, <laughs> but so I have a shaded patio. It's shaded by a large avocado tree. Avocados do do really well here. And so under the tree, I have like my house plants. I have a Hoya that I've had for 20 years. It's huge. Mm-hmm. And then I've got begonias and I've got my epiphytes all hanging under there and some staghorn ferns. And in the back of that patio, I have uh, the passion flower. So when I did start breeding passion flower, I actually had to breed it at my house because of disease issues. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the vegetative passion flower on the market has disease of some sort. And because of sanitary conditions, I couldn't bring it into the greenhouse at work to cross. So I was doing all the crossing actually at home. Um, and so now I'm not doing crossing at home. We've gotten past the disease issues and it makes just a really nice cover for what was a really ugly fence. Um, and then the Gulf fritillaries love it. So there's caterpillars all over it right now and the butterflies love it. And my cats love to chase butterflies. So <laughs> it all works out. Like a lovely garden. Yeah. <laughs> and then in the back, I do have a sunny area on a side yard. It's kind of a community yard and I've got raised beds so that they're not, I don't have plants in the sand. And during COVID it was all in vegetables. Um, mm. But this year I turned a couple into just habitat and food for for butterflies um the the milkweed because it is pretty easy to take care of and i've got about 100 caterpillars back there Mm -hmm. and then i've got some verbena bonariensis um the tall verbena because the butterflies love that too it's so cool i'm sitting here at michael's and i can see out Mm. out of his front window and (laughs) he's got tons of verbena bonariensis yeah it's so tall I Such love it. It's, um, I don't know if this is the right word. It's like opaque. Is that the right word? Where you can mm-hmm. see through it, but That's it's still. Mm-hmm. Do I mean translucent? Transparent is see-through. <laughs> Opaque is not see-through. Oh, I mean translucent then, where you can so part, it's like partly a, see through it. Yeah, you partly can. Yeah, it's like uh, <laughs> vanette. Is that a word? Oh no, I, d- I don't know any of these words. words. Um, <laughs> I don't my know question what would be. Um, has anybody ever looked at verbena bonariensis in different colours? Because I appreciate there's a dwarf, mm-hmm, but what about mm-hmm. different colours? Because it must be one of the most in-demand perennials. You, you know? know, and I think the demand for it is growing too. Yeah. Because people are loving that co- cottage garden mm-hmm. feel, and it attracts butterflies. Mm. I think if there's other colours, they're probably not much different than the original pinkish yeah. purple. But you'd think someone would like have selected out like a darker or a lighter and yeah. tried to release it. I did. Um, I don't know if you know Ray Brown at Plant World in Devon in the UK. I don't. He, um, I used to visit him a lot many years ago, and he used to tell me stories about a white flowered verbena bonariensis. Mm. But I don't know if that still exists or not. So that sounds good. Yeah, there was one out there at some point. Imagine but, that. Mm. That would look beautiful. I know. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, well, my question then is, can <laughs> someone like me hybridize a new plant at home? Like, is it possible for you to have a go at doing it at home yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I did finally start getting into plant breeding, um, 
I started playing around with um, squash. So I was I would suggest that if you want to start breeding something, something like squash would be um, a good place to start okay. for a few reasons. One, the flowers are huge. Um, so it's just fun when you have big flowers to work with. When you have to work with the small flowers, it's very painstaking. You might have to use tweezers or a paintbrush and it can be hard on your hands. Um, and so there's the, the big flower aspects to it. And the other aspect is squash has male and female flowers. So you're not having to emasculate a plant, which is also time consuming. Um, and then squash has different colors and forms. So, you know, you could cross, uh, cr cross a yellow squash with a green squash, grow out the fruit, wait till it gets really, really big, much larger than you would usually harvest it, harvest some seeds and plant them out. And you probably wouldn't have to plant out very many to see your hybrid. Um, and a lot of times it probably won't be good, but you can at least say, I made this. <laughs> so oh, I remember that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow, good place to start. Yeah. yeah thank you. Um, you but it's not, sometimes it's not necessarily about breeding with an intention. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. about observation and mm -hmm. actually you will notice something that is growing quite differently in your garden already. Sometimes if you kind of get to know the plants and kind of just, inspect them more carefully than you would kind of in just it's just passing and I know when I was working at Thompson and Morgan there were various plants that will have come from customers gardens and they didn't breed them they just happened to notice that they were different like you know a, a blue flowered poppy rois or you know um we had a very deep colored uh orientali poppy as well once and I even in my first week there I had to fly to Scotland to collect a star-shaped petunia I don't know if that still exists actually I think it was released as a seed mix a couple of years ago called fireworks Okay. And it has like a divided like petal to it. So they really mm -hmm. are like a star, but that makes it more weatherproof awesome. because obviously it doesn't get floppy. But these were all examples where they just came up as sports in customers' mm -hmm. gardens. So it is about observation as much as actually breeding, you know, something intentionally, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you nailed it. Getting to know your plants. Like mm -hmm. when I am making selections, I walk through my greenhouse over and over and over mm. again. I walk probably six miles a day, just looking and looking and yeah. seeing what's different. Is there a trait there that I want? Is, um, is there something different? Or even when I'm just at my trials, just walking back and forth, yeah. um, observation is, is really important. And so, yeah, you can tie that into the, the home gardener doing breeding because, you know, you don't have to hybridize something to breed something. Mm -hmm. um, you could grow out a thousand zinnias. You can pull out the ones you don't want and then let them pollinate amongst themselves, collect seed off those. And then essentially you'll have a group of zinnias with the traits you like. Mm -hmm. um, so you can make open pollinated um, open pollinated groups of plants and you're still, that's still plant breeding. Mm. Um, you're just making your own land race of Xenia. So you can say, you know, that patch of Xenia over there. I did that. That's mine. Mm. That's got my name on it. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, I might get rid yeah. of some of them now. Then. <laughs> <laughs> really, I've got great memories of, um, we used to go and visit the breeding like every week or so to assess the different kind of groups of plants. And I remember walking through like a field of probably 10,000 Budlia. And that's mm. when we first picked out things like Budlia Buzz, the short I've ones, got that in my ones garden. with different colours. Mm. And it's such, and it's an exciting time when you pick out those and you yeah. really, your eye gets trained to look for those differences as well. So it is yes. about just being um, observant, being a nosy neighbour. <laughs> yes, for sure. So many times I'll walk through a trial with um, somebody that's not a breeder in the company and they're like, oh my God, that's so cool. I'm like, oh, it's got woody stems. You know? <laughs> <laughs> As a breeder, we have a different eye. Yeah. So we can just see things. I'm like, I love it too. I understand what you're saying, but it could never be a commercial product because of that. So it's about wow. getting to know. Well, do you remember when I posted a photograph of a Cosmos, I think last year, and uh, somebody contacted me about oh, it because it was a different yeah, yeah. looking cosmos. Mm, to one that's cool. Yeah. yeah, that's really and cool. And that's how many new plants pop yeah. up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, patent it. 
Yeah, <laughs> put, your, put your name on it. <laughs> Register I'm it. Call it my name. I've always wanted to name it after me. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons I wanted to be a plant breeder. I'm like, yeah. I want something called Laura. I want something called my mom's name, my brother's oh. name, my cat's <laughs> name. <laughs> Your whole family in plants. I love yes. that. But it, yeah, it has to be a commercially viable name, though, Laura. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I can't That's tell like you how many. This could always sell more. <laughs> yes, it, very true. It is very true, mm. actually. I have genuinely just bought plants because I like the name. Yeah. Or, it's you know, so a, 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 like yes. roses, for mm. example. I often just literally pick a rose because I like yeah. the name, no other real reason. Oh, that's actually, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Can I ask you that question, actually, before we go? How mm. much are you involved in kind of how the marketing goes out and the naming process, being that you're the one that created the plant? Yeah. It, it really it just depends. So, mm-hmm. um, with Goodnight Kiss, I didn't come up with that name. It was my my product manager. And as soon as we heard it, we knew it was the one. Mm-hmm. Um, other products like the, the Cha Cha line of Calabacoa, um, I think it's a different name in Europe because in in mm-hmm. Florence didn't like the name Cha Cha. So I think they actually called it Cabaret Excel yeah, or yeah. Cabaret Big. Um, so it really... It really just depends on how good the name is that each person puts forward. Mm. Like the company likes everybody con- to contribute, especially when it's something harder. Um, mm. We just came out with the the coleus Spitfire, and it's a new small coleus. And I had been calling it Fry Guy for about three years as we were working through it because I don't know if y'all know the McDonald's Fry Guys. They're like have French fries for hair. No, <laughs> I'm getting the weirdest look from you. No, uh-huh. I didn't that um, okay. Uh, <laughs> you have, like you have, have never eaten McDonald's. <laughs> maybe that's why we decided to not call it Fry Guys because Europe would have no idea. Well, things um, do mean different things in different countries. Yeah. Like you could have a word that suddenly then means bum in Australia or something. Yeah. You? Yes, so you have to be careful. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, we do have to be careful. Um, yeah. So at the end, we had we had talked about hundreds of names um, and we, we went with Spitfire and it ended up being a really good name and we'll probably end up making a whole series of, of micro coleus with essentially, you know, fire as the theme. Oh, I so. like that. Micro coleus. I like that. Yeah, that's as well, really though. cool. Really yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, they're fun. What a fascinating insight uh, into the world of breeding. I've been completely enthralled, and I, now I just want to go and see what I can do in my own little garden. Yes, you know? yes. Have a good look around your allotment and see what might have hybridised already. Maybe, yeah, mm. there's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Um, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. And You're I welcome. Know our are going to really yeah, enjoy this. Yeah, really, one, really fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank and, you. And, I hope you have enjoy the rest of your day because it's early there, isn't it? We're we're coming to the yeah. end of it, and you're up yeah. Early. <laughs> and stop moaning about the cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, oh, thank well. you so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you, thank you darling. <laughs> Thank y'all. I'll see y'all later. I'm Nat and my family run a bedding plant nursery just north of Liverpool called Happy Plants. As much as we're based in the northwest, we supply garden centres all across the country and even through Wales and Scotland and as far down as the Channel Islands. So pretty much anywhere you are in the UK, you can nip into a garden centre nearby and find something with our name on. So we thought it might be nice to give you a bit of a behind the scenes look at what goes on on a commercial nursery. So at Happy Plants, we have 11 acres of greenhouses, which we use to produce around 11 million plants per year. Anybody who ever visits us is always a little bit gobsmacked by the scale of what we do. However, we are actually only the 51st biggest nursery in the country. So there is a heck of a lot of work that goes into producing all of those plants that you can pick up off. 
the garden center and supermarket shelves. We buy all of the plants in as tiny, tiny seedlings. A lot of them are even too small to be handled by the human hand. And we grow them on up to the point that you see them on the garden center shelf. So sometimes the timelines of what we have on the nursery can be quite different from what people would expect. For example, at the moment, you might be buying primroses and pansies, but we'll be planting things like sonetti um, for spring, etc. If you're buying cyclamen at the moment, they would have been with us since, since sort of May. And the production of the seedlings for the cyclamen will have started sort of this time last year nearly. So I'm going to be popping up sort of once a month for a little while and hopefully I can use that time to help you see what goes on behind the scenes, how those plants get to the garden centre shelf and also hopefully give you an insight on some of the exciting developments that are happening in the industry. It's such an exciting time for horticulture with gardening more popular than ever. So hopefully we can take you with us on the journey through these next few months. So I don't actually know how to start this gossip without kind of a little squeal because I'm so excited to be completely surrounded by sweet peas. <laughs> and the fragrance, can you imagine the fragrance of basically a greenhouse full of yeah. sweet peas? Welcome to the podcast, by the way, Chris. How many sweet pea plants are in here? surrounding us oh there's a good oh you've stumped me there mm -hmm. a <laughs> lot a lot there's a lot thousands oh. there's gotta be thousands right so we're yeah we're basically in a greenhouse with chris and there's rows and rows of sweet peas we're recording this in the summer but we're going to talk about sweet peas and how to make sure that you grow them nicely over winter so you've got lovely strong plants the following year but we're currently amongst some really pretty pink varieties there's a row of kind of deep reddy colour as well as mm. blue. We've even had a little insight into some new colours that are going to be available very soon as well. And I am literally like a kid in a sweet shop. <laughs> wow. Tell us all about it, Chris. Like, what, what are you doing here? Because you're growing them to cut for florist but also for the seed right yes yeah, so it's mainly for producing seed and um, this year it will be stock seed and then sales every year after that um, but what i have been doing is supplying local florists um, who've been coming in picking their own and um, even placing orders with me to deliver them wow. and the more flowers that you pick obviously the more seed you'll get in the end so it it, it works on on both accounts um, and yeah I, I sowed them in october and they're still flowering mid-July when we talk so yeah they've just done phenomenally well yeah it's amazing and also you were saying earlier on that you haven't had to feed them at all I haven't fed them one bit I've, mm, I've got feed maybe. ready to go but I don't think I'm going to need to put any in the ground this year god that's amazing that it's amazing they're, it's abundantly full of mm. sweet peas as well but would you say they've done well because they're under glass like because a home gardener would you need to feed if you're outdoors right is that fair to say I think or yeah the earlier sowing that's done that yeah th th they had a good start um, with the early sowings and they were put in the ground in January mm -hmm. um, and I think with all the nutrients in the ground sweet peas and the pea family tend to like um, soil that hasn't been touched for a few years mm. and this soil was never grown in there was always pots on top of it so the fertilizer i guess from those pots has leached into the soil and that's what's um, right. so perhaps a richer soil than people would have in their back gardens but obviously that has benefited you yes yeah. I, I, I i tell a slight lie um, when i planted them i did put um a bit of uh, grow more down okay um but that's all they've had so i haven't wow. liquid fed them at all well, that's amazing, isn't it? Like, uh, mine are outside, obviously, and clearly not on this kind of scale, but I don't feed them. The ground is mulched in autumn time, and that's it. And then they were planted out early May, I think, ish. Oh, God, mine are so pitiful. I'm not sure they're even going to flower. Next year. I know. <laughs> Sweet peas are for you next year, Michael. I need to start off earlier. You yeah, know, I October. wasn't. Um, I was probably sowing them, like, even in March. That's kind of, like, Yeah. Disgusting. We'll just get them off to a late start and maybe yeah. not such strong roots. But you were saying October's the best time to sow them? October, I found, is the best time, and I was recommended it, and, yeah, it, it seems to work. Um, in March sowings, you tend to get weaker plants, more fleshy. Um, October sowings, they generally seem to be taller yeah. um, and much more floriferous, shall yeah, we say. Yeah, probably like that. Floriferous. I can't even say it. Look at the foliage this is like a hosta <laughs> this is so strong like, it's not often we actually admire the beauty of sweet pea foliage and tender no it's lovely that. isn't it it's it's really glorious yeah. now, and also you were saying obviously when you sow them for people not to worry about the fact they might be left in a greenhouse over winter 
the cold doesn't matter. That's a good thing, isn't it? The cold is a good thing. Um, and if you can get them growing uh, through a, a few frosts, then, yeah, so much the better. It will create stronger plants. It, there seems to be a lot of people think that if they put sweet peas out too early, they might get frosted and it might kill them off complete opposite I, mm. I say keep them out in the frosts and they will perform for you yeah I, I, that's from my amateur experience is exactly the same thing you know we always I had a friend who um, he's called Kenny he's a head gardener at Bolwick Hall in Norfolk and I always see him planting his sweet peas out like in April and we still get frost in May and I'm always like oh my gosh that's so early and he always says they'll be fine and he always has the most beautiful sweet peas yeah. mm. you know but we always panic don't we because we're planting them out because we're like don't plant your things out too early <laughs> but sweet peas are totally you can go yeah. for it so um, most of these varieties here have the most beautiful long strong straight stems and they're Spencer varieties, aren't they? Yes, they're all Spencers, apart from one variety, which is an heirloom, which has slightly shorter stems. Right, OK. So Spencer varieties are the ones that tend to have the longer stems, I've, I, and I've grown some as well, and that's definitely the case. What's... The, I guess florists particularly like the ones with the long stems, don't they, for bouquets and stuff. So what's the benefit to sowing other ones that don't have long, strong, straight stems? That's really a tongue twister, by the way. <laughs> to say that <laughs> i think the scent um, is one thing shorter stem varieties in my opinion tend to have better stronger scents to them um the long stems will produce a lot of lovely flowers for you but the, the scents aren't as strong right that that's what i that's what i've found okay well that's super interesting and also uh, earlier on you were saying that the white variety over there has a much stronger fragrance to the colorful varieties but i always find like you you're drawn to the color assuming that that will be fragrant but m that's not always the case is it do you know what i mean you kind of look for the color you're like oh that must be a really beautiful fragrance but the <coughs> white is much more fragrant by the way i just sniffed that petal and it went right up my nose <laughs> If, um, if there's any difference between the fragrances, I guess it's quite hard in here to clear your nose in between. Maybe you need to sniff some ginger in between. <laughs> like when you're having sushi. Yeah. Clear your palate. But yeah, I do wonder if there's slightly different sweet pea fragrances or different kind of nuances in what you get from that fragrance. I mean, when, when you've been working in here a while, your nose tends to get used to all the scents. So, so <laughs> you not smell them anymore? I, I don't smell them as much as I did at the I start of the so season. I feel so bad for you, you can't smell them. <laughs> <laughs> we need to put you outside, turn, spin you around 14 times, and then you come back in, you'll smell them. <laughs> That's a thing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, it is now. Clearly. <laughs> uh, I love it. I could, I mean, this is the dream job. You must not want to go home at night. No, no, it, it does keep you here for a bit longer than uh, you like, and uh, yeah, the <laughs> boss, the, the boss, the boss doesn't like it at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Oh, yeah, <laughs> well, when it's you take gorgeous. Back a bunch of sweet peas, all is forgiven. Right? All is forgiven. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Oh, you have like all these sweet peas that you can just take home every night. Well, not all of them, but you can cut some to put in a vase every night. Amazing. Yeah, but the more he cuts, the less he can sell. Well, yeah, You've got to think about there are a lot here. <laughs> there are a lot here. Uh, well, I thank you so much for having us here today. I always love seeing behind the scenes, you know, growers and breeders. I know we've said it before. Yeah, Michael we, has often <laughs> taken me to these places, well, knowing we, I love it. We've kept her in captivity for four series. For series five, we're going to let her out of <laughs> the box a little bit more, see how she goes. <laughs> She's that's, still going to be on reins, though. That's so scary. <laughs> 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 In a romper suit. <laughs> in a romper suit. I stop at the nappy, though, all right? <laughs> it's gorgeous. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming on the podcast and having us here. I'm just going to go and skip around a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. The music for the Bump Bass podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James. And our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi-Echo.